Yeah. C over 2 plus 82 minus 2A. Solve for C. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Are we ready to start? All right, thank you. All right. <laughs> well, that's a big advantage, again, of a thin client doing web-based stuff. You don't need anything but a client to do that. You don't need a particularly powerful machine. Anyhow. The, the, the questions that we were talking about before close, there are a lot of good questions, and I don't, I don't mind answering them to the degree that I can, but uh, uh, again, yeah, uh, um, you know, it, it, it is, you know, when you, when you compare IT and computer science, uh, again, a lot of it depends on who's talking. Uh, there would be a lot of overlap between jobs that one would do versus the other. Um, there are some jobs that would, you'd be better prepared to with a computer science degree. There'd be other jobs. Um, um, where um, IT would be um, probably um, a better focus. Um, IT would stress, I think, people skills more than computer science would. Compu computer science, if your job is to work for Oracle and work on the next version of their database or, or something like that, um, you have a very technical, specific thing to do and, and solve that. Um, that's different than going into an organization and finding out what kind of software they need and what kind of website they need or what kind of mobile app they need and then going and providing the solution. You know, you need, you need in IT the ability to interface with people and, and uh, discuss stuff and, and figure out the solution as opposed to simply being a tech guy, you know, or, or tech um, woman. You know, you need the ability to go in and analyze the problem. Um, and therefore, you need communication skills. Not to say you don't need communication skills in the hardcore CS stuff, too. But there would be probably more chance for you to, to you know, in, in computer science, you're probably dealing with more other technical people. Whereas in IT, you're going to be dealing with technical people and, and uh, um, users. Yeah. Is my mic on? I think so. There you go. Probably. I, um, certifications, you know, I, I could just give this answer. I could sit up here and just give this answer over and over again. Um, depends who you talk to. Depends, you know, there are people who really heavily value certifications. Um, and there's other people that are like, you got a certification? Well, okay, uh, what else do you, can you do, you know? Um, well, yeah, that, 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 it, it, how do I want to say? It doesn't mean nothing, but it doesn't mean everything, yeah. you know. Um, and again, some people will value them more highly than others. In the past, my experience, I worked for uh, places where I would look and say, that person is certified and this person isn't, you know, and be like, really? That kind of makes me wonder about the certification process. N no, I'm certifiable, but I'm not certified. Yeah. The one thing I would say about certification is, is your job, or, or your, I don't want to say job when you're looking for a job, but, but your goal when you're looking for a job is to differentiate you among all the other candidates 
that they're receiving. So anything you can do to differentiate yourself is a positive. Because I've been in a situation where you're hiring, and if you look at a bunch of entry-level resumes, they all look the same. All right, and again, that that's no that's no disrespect to any of them. They may all be equally qualified or unqualified. All right, but the fact is, is that many, many, many entry level resumes look the same, and uh, therefore, anything you can do to differentiate yourself and to show that you can do the job is beneficial. So, certification would be one example. Does it mean everything? No, but hey. At least that's further evidence that this person can do the job. What is this person showing me that proves that they can do the job better than this person? Well, they got a certificate, so if I got to bet on one of them, that might be the way to bet. Get the job, just figure out what you have to do daily. And right. Make it, make it. Right. Um, and, and again, you know, the, the one company I worked for, uh, being a consulting company, they wanted to be able to say, we have X number of... Microsoft certified developers, just so, you know, as a marketing thing. It really didn't matter if it made you a better developer or not, right? Because, you know, that's like, well, we're USDA software developers, you know, or whatever. You know, we have the stamp, but we're grade A prime developers, you know, or, or something along those lines. So again, um, you know, there's reasons for it, but for someone breaking into the field, the value would be that it can differentiate you. But there's other ways to differentiate yourself as well, such as internships, such as doing work for, um, and I hesitate to say this because there are people and organizations that take advantage of this, but like doing like work for free, you know, yeah, pro bono work, uh, like for a nonprofit or something, um, you know. I, I'm a firm believer of, you know, you should get paid for what you do, but, you know, there's also a sense that if it's, like, if it, if it was a cause that you believed in anyhow, you know, if there was a nonprofit or or some church group or social group or whatever that you belong to anyhow, and you wanted to contribute to them by doing some work, that would be another way. Or just having a tech blog, even, you know, or whatever. These are all ways that you can demonstrate that you can do the stuff. Uh, that you need to do. And everything else really, again, depends on who's getting your resume, you know. Um, you know, there's people that are really um, um, intent on four-year degrees versus two-year degrees. And then there's people that like, well, I don't care if you have any degree if you can show me you do the job. So it's a crapshoot. You got to do your best to, to maximize it. And good thing about job uh, seeking is you just need to find one. Right, you just need to find one good fit for you, and 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 then yeah, then you're in good shape, and then your options open because when you have a position, you have the experience, and you're demonstrating that you can do it, and a lot of opportunities that weren't available for you open up. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah, everyone, yeah, it's it's the whole student dilemma. Anyhow, um, Android, uh, the <laughs> yeah, right, right. What, the amazing thing too is it'll come through and, and uh, I, I, from time to time we'll get like listings of like intern opportunities. And when I, you look at the skill sets for the, they want for like an intern, it's like if someone had those skills they wouldn't be working as an intern, right? They'd be out on the job market or starting up their own business or, or something, you know? And uh, again, it's an internship op uh, opportunity. Now, the only thing I'll say is People want everything. What people want versus what people get are two different things. I might want a car that gets 200 miles per gallon, that, you know, whatever. That might be what I want. And if you ask me to, to, to describe it, I might de describe it that way. But, you know, what you end up getting is different. Yeah, we can we can we can even chat after class someday or something. But re, yeah, remind me. I, I can go over that if I can remember any of them. <laughs> That's probably the bigger question. All right. So we're looking at the address book, and I never did figure out why the address book stopped working, but I did get it working again by re-importing it from Eclipse. So 
we're okay. Today we are going to look at the database um, functionality for it. And again, when I go over a lot of these things, in addition to simply looking at the specific problem we're trying to solve, we try to think of bigger issues as well, bigger programming issues. So for example, what's good in this case is how they've abstracted everything dealing with the database and put it somewhere. All right. Uh, the activities call this, call the database object, they make the database object and call it, but everything dealing with the database is in this one place. So thinking if you were working as like, you know, imagine a few scenarios. One, you're working as a team to develop this application. Well, you put the person that knows most about databases on this class to nail it and get it running perfectly. All right. Or you're someone that's maintaining this app. There's a problem with the database, updating something in the database, you know exactly where to look. You don't have to sift through classes after classes and so on. So here is, I want to go over this and then we'll spend some time reviewing the stuff that we went over last time. But I want to get the database object handled first. Here's my database connector object. Maybe. And let me bring this into Let me bring this in the text edit so we can take a closer look. Yeah, it's not long at all. All right. Here's our class. Here's some of the attributes. All right. We have a database name. It would be possible for an application to access and update more than one database. Not sure really why you would do that, but keep in mind that sometimes things develop along a path. And there isn't always good reasons for things, all right? But, so you could do that. You could have uh, multiple databases if you wanted to. SQLite database is the database object itself. And then finally, we have a database open helper, which is sort of a helper class. Now, we've seen these helper classes all over the place, right? The inflator you could consider a helper class. It allows you to do a job. You don't have to worry about how to do a particular thing. You just call a method on that class, and you get what you need. All right. Here is, excuse me, here is a constructor for the database connector object. And it points the database helper object to the proper database. Did I go over? I don't think we did, no. The context really is just everything about the current environment that it's running in. So, um, We've seen that probably in a lot of different methods when, and we didn't take a lot of time to, um, to go through this. All right. Here we're going and we call the open throws SQL exception. So if it cannot open the database, it throws an exception. We're opening the database, and we're calling the getWritable database method on it. Now, down here is our data open helper. All right. That. 
when we create, let's, let's go back to square one. When we create our database connector object, it creates a database open helper. Okay? That class is down here, which is a private class and it extends the SQLite open helper. All right? So the SQLite open helper is probably more analogous to the inflator. In other words, it does, it helps you out with the job. Now notice what this constructor does is this constructor goes and creates the database within the context with the name that it has, nothing for the factory, and a version of one, all right, in this case. Notice that when we call this, we give the database name, we give nothing for the factory, but we give a version of one, all right? Why do we need to know the version of the database that we're working on? Well, let's think about it. Pardon me? All right. All kind of good thoughts, but let's think this through a little bit. Let's say I write my first version of the application. All right. So, version one of the app corresponds to version one of the database. And in that contacts, I have a contact name. Um, let's see what we have. Contact name, phone, email, city, state, and zip. All right. So one of the pieces of functionality that we decide to add is something with the birthday. You know, hey, let's, let's, let's be able to tell people who, you know, one of their contacts' birthday is today or something like that. Any attribute, it doesn't really matter. But let's say birthday. So the version one application has contact name, phone, email, city, state, and zip. And the database has a contact table that has those same four fields. Let's imagine that I upgrade. And I might even have automatic upgrade turned on for this. And it downloads it when it feels like it. So I now upgrade to version 2. And this page, the contact page, wants to show contact name, phone, email, city, state, zip, and birth date. Well, not in that database, right? So what does that mean? Is that person not able to upgrade? No, I would hate that to be the case, that once you have installed the application, you can't upgrade to a newer, newer version because there's been database changes made. What do you need to do? You need to upgrade the database as well. To database version 2, where the contact table has name, phone, email, city, date, zip, and birthday. All right. So, there's going to be code in the database helper to help us with that. The database open helper. That's this whole job, right, is to help us opening the database. And it can look and it can verify if the version of the database that we want is not the version that we have, then it can perform an upgrade. All right. Because if you think about it, you don't want to, if you upgrade, delete all the contacts and start with an empty contact data uh, table. That's not the right answer. You simply want to execute a SQL statement to add a birth date column to the contact table. And that's what the helper object does. So, 
when we go in and we try to open the database and we're passing it a 1, if the database has already been created, we can open it and there's no problem. If, however, the version of the database that we have on the device is different than the version that the application is expected, we have an upgrade method built into that class that we can write some code. We even have, and that method gets, two arguments, the old version and the new version. So we could even write code how to handle it if, if someone upgraded from version 1 to version 3. Right? We could do the update to take them from version 1 of the database to version 2, and then update the version 2 database up to version 3. All right? So that's the mechanism by which it is done. All right? If the database is opened, when we go to open the database, and here we're creating that class, and we're initializing those fields, and that will open the database. If we open the database, and the database out there does not match the database that we have, then it will run the on upgrade routine. Yes? Okay. Now, what about the very first time that someone goes and creates this? All right. The database needs to be created. So, we have in the database helper, an onCreate method. And what that does is that creates the database table. Now, some of you may have had the CISS 143 or 243 or other classes like that or done database querying in other classes where you've used the select, insert, update, and delete. There's a whole category of SQL statements that don't relate to performing queries, but actually perform uh, relate to creating and updating the tables itself. So the create command is a SQL command, all right, and it does exactly what it says. It's going to create a table, name contacts. The primary key is underscore ID. It's an integer. It's a primary key. And it's auto increment. Auto increment simply means that the first row added is going to get a value of 1. The second row is going to get a value of 2 and so on. It's just a automatically generated. I have a name that's a text field. An email is a text field, a phone is a text field, a street is a text field, and a city that's a text field. So, if I go and open this helper object, and I create this helper object to get a writable database, and one doesn't exist, this onCreate method fires up and will make one for me. All right? If one existed but it's the wrong version, then it's going to call on upgrade and tell me what version I have and what version the application is expecting. So three scenarios. All right. Scenario one would be I've already, I have the proper database installed. Then it just opens it, right? No big deal. Number two, I'm, in, I'm running the program for the first time and I have no database. In that case, the onCreate method gets called of the database helper. Third scenario, I have a database installed, but it is an old version, in which case I would run the on upgrade method. And I could execute st uh, statements to add a column or add a new table or any kind of structural changes I want to make to the database. I could make via a SQL command in the on upgrade. So that's what gets the database out there. And that's what keeps the database out there even after we upgrade our app and add new tables, columns, whatever. Yes? No. 
no, this also this also handles like storing it and where it's putting it and all that. Simply by providing a context and providing the name of the database, it knows where to put it. All right. Now, we have, if I'm not mistaken, how many methods here? We have... Let me, let me write them down. We have... What database operations do we perform in this? We do an insert when we add a new contact. We do an update when we go and change a contact. We do a delete when we delete a contact. We get all contacts when we want the list. We get one contact when we go to edit. All right? So, we can see all these things, how they run. So we go in the address book. There, we've gotten a list. So that's one of the operations that we have, is get all the contacts. We click here and add a contact. We've done an insert. That's two of the database operations. We click on one contact, we retrieve one contact. That's the third database operation. We go and edit that contact. And that's a fourth database operation, I lost count. Finally, we click on this and delete a contact. That's the last operation. So we have methods for all of these. And that's the nice thing about these, these methods, is that we put them in the one place, the other place simply invokes them when it's appropriate. So you click a button, you call the delete method, and this has a code to do that. So, three of these methods don't really return anything. All right? Insert and update and delete don't really return anything. They simply perform the operation and there you go. All right? So, for example, the insert method, all right, that is part of my data connector object, I go and I create a new contact, right? which is going to be a set of values. I take and stuff the name, email, phone, city, and, and uh, state in there. I open the database. I call insert and close the database. So I don't even need to know the insert command. right? I don't need to know the SQL command to do that. All I need to, so if I don't know SQL, I can still use this. And that's, that's kind of a good thing, I suppose. You should know SQL, but if you don't use SQL, this allows you to do it. So, simply we, we have supplied the table that we want to insert into. We then put in a, a list of pairs of values. 
name, name, email, email, phone, phone. These in quotes correspond to the column names when we created the database. All right. No, it, it isn't. And, and remember that, you know, we could call this variable anything. You know, we could call it Charlie and then put Charlie there for the street address. As long as it's pulling the value from the street text box when it calls this method, then we'll be okay. And I did not write this. Deedle had a, a bad night when he wrote this. Yes? I have seen tools that allow you to do that. Yes. And I have seen tools that run out of the browser that allow you to access it via an emulator. So it is a little bit of a pain. I'm not aware off the top of my head of one, but if you looked at, you know, if you, if you Googled Android emulator, SQLite, editor, debugger, whatever, it, it, would, it would likely have that. It was a pain, though, if I remember right. Maybe there's better tools now. But... Um, all right. So that's an insert. What did we do again? We created one of these content values objects. We put in the pairs of column name, comma, value. Where did these values come from? Well, the values come from the arguments of the function. All right. We fill that in. We open the database, do the update or rather the insert and close it. I'm sorry, that one was update. This one is insert. Pardon me? An insert would, uh, would require you to implement certain methods. However, what database operations do you want to perform in an application? Okay. Maybe. Maybe not. All right. In other words, how many tables are going to be in your database? You don't know. Could be a bunch of them. So therefore, you couldn't really build an interface to say that I want to be able to insert into table one, insert into table two, insert into table three. In other words, there's no pattern that we could, we could require this to do. All right? In other words, in this case, all we're doing is doing with contacts. So we have insert, update, and delete. If we had, for example, contacts and um, destinations, all right. Then we might have insert contact, insert destination. So we have two inserts then. So an interface doesn't really, um, uh, wouldn't really be relevant uh, in that case because, again, you could have as many tables as you needed. All right. Yes. That is a darn good question. I think it's a different way to create... Um, a database. SQLite Android. Ah, okay. What is the use of the cursor factory if you want to implement a specialized cursor of your own. Okay. So that factory isn't for the databases, for the cursors. 
What's a cursor again? Think of a cursor as a list of items that you want to loop through. All right. Yeah, unless unless you had a reason to create a custom cursor, you needed to, to get at the data a certain way that the regular cursor wouldn't allow you to, then you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't need that. You could just always put null. Okay. Update looks a lot like the insert. We have our content values. We put the different content values there. Except we add to the update a where clause. That's what that is. In other words, we're updating. Do we want to update everyone? No, we just want to update the one row, the row that has a certain ID of whatever. Now, last but not least, somewhere up here, or down here, oh, is a delete. And the delete, to delete a row from the database, you simply say, I want to delete and specify the where clause. So you don't need, um, you don't need a list of values. When you delete a row, you delete the entire row. So you don't need to create those content values like you did for an insert or a update. Let's look at the code that calls these. All right. So let's look at, in Android Studio, let's look at add edit contact and let's look at the save contact method. All right. Remember, this the the activity that I pulled this from is the add edit contact. And it determines whether it's doing an insert or an edit based on whether it has something in the extras. Cuz remember, when an activity is created, we can pass something on with the activity as part of the extras. Well, in the case of an add, we don't pass anything. We start with an empty slate. So we don't pass anything with the extras of that activity. With, a, with an update, though, we do pass something. Namely, we pass the values or, no, we pass, yeah, we pass the values of the name, the address, and so on. So when it's time to save the contact, we look to see if anything was passed with the extras or not. If something was passed on the if nothing was passed on the extras, we do this. If nothing was passed, oh I'm sorry, if something was passed, if not nothing was passed, we do this. So the insert contact, and again, this is why that can say state in the other one in street here. We're pulling it from the proper edit text field. We just are calling it state in that function. So when it's time to do an insert, we create our database connector object that opens up our database, provides it the context and all that. We go and set, or we call the method and we pass the values from the different text boxes. Those get plugged in. Name, email, phone, state, which should be street, or city. We put all those in our content values and then go and issue an insert. The update works the same way except we have a row ID in the update. And instead of calling the insert, it calls the update, which 
puts all the values and or the columns and values in the content values um, collection and then issues the update command saying that we have the where clause only updating where the ID equals the ID that got passed. All right. On to the last two, and that's the two queries. The two queries are different than insert, update, and delete. All right. Insert, update, and delete simply do their job and they're done. Whereas queries, where I do a select data, I'm um, pulling data, it has to return back the set of data that is obtained. So if I do an insert, either the insert worked or it didn't. All right. If I do a query to say, give me all my contacts, well, either it worked or it didn't. But in addition to that, it needs to tell me, here is your list of contacts. Well, what is a list? A list is a cursor. All right. A cursor is a list. Um, again, it's a list that you typically read from start to end. And the cursor part of it comes from, you can think of there being like a cursor and you are scrolling through each row in the result set, just like you might scroll through if I had a list of values here. So get all contacts, we do a database query and want it from the contacts table. What columns do I want? I want the ID and name. These four parameters correspond to four clauses in a SQL select statement. All right. So if you've done SQL select statements, um, one of them would be the WHERE clause. One of them probably would be the GROUP BY clause. One of them would be the JOIN clause probably. And I'm not sure what the other one would be. We can look it up in a second here. The last one is, guess what? The order by clause. So in other words, for those of you that know SQL, this statement translates to select ID name from contacts, order by name. So that's the SQL statement that this corresponds to. If you don't know SQL, you just need to know what arguments you need to plug in here. And let's look for a complete Um, definition. And there's actually there's an overloaded method. So there's a variety of different versions of it. But I am guessing this is the one we are using. First argument is a table. Second argument is an array of the columns that we want. The third argument would be the where clause. The fourth argument would be a list of arguments for the WHERE clause. Then we have GROUP BY, HAVING, and finally ORDER BY. And then there's a limit. We're not. HAVING is used with a GROUP BY. So if I was doing an aggregate function, I could limit to show me only the customers that have more than three orders. All right. 
But again, you just supply those things and it gives you, actually I think this is the version we were using. Table, columns, selection, selection arguments, group by, having, and finally order by. So that's the one we were using. And if we need to supply more, we can supply more um, arguments in here. All right. So, whoops. This returns a cursor. And what is a cursor? A cursor is a result set. It's a set of data. You could think of it as being a list of rows in the database. All right. What do we have for each row? We have two columns for each row. We have an ID and a name. And it's ordered by name. All right. Now, to go back to something that we looked at way at the beginning of this, grab this whole thing. On post execute our thread our thread to get all the contacts. We created as an asynchronous task. And we created our new database and we call that get all contacts method. That is running in the background. So I can still interact with the GUI as it is retrieving all those contacts. When it is done, when that asynchronous task is done, we need to sync things up again. And at that point we set the cursor associated with our adapter to the results that we got. So that, this line here is what populates the list that we see in the list views adapter with the results of that database query. All right. Now, When we go to view a contact, we also have an asynchronous task. But the asynchronous task is to pull one contact. All right. What contact are we pulling? We're pulling the one ID, based on the ID. What does the query look like for that? It's going to look almost the same, except it is going to have a where clause. And that's the where clause, and that pulls up the contact by ID. We still get back a cursor, right? Because that's what you get when you run a query. Now, we know because we're pulling up based on the ID that this query is only going to ever have one contact in it. So, When we finish this asynchronous activity and we're syncing back up again on post execute, we first move to the first row in the results data set. 
Well, it's the only row, right? Because we pulled up based on the primary key. We grab the values from that query, the name, phone, email, street, and so on. And then we set those values to the values of the text views. So that's what populates that. All right? So a lot going on in this application that's new that we haven't seen before. We have the activities. We have the um, asynchronous operations. And finally, we have the database um, connectivity. All right. We also have the menus, which use a menu inflator. And then based on the options selected, we can tell and we can go and do the appropriate action based on which menu item got selected. Questions on this? I know there's a lot to do. Yes? Yeah, you, you can basically use this as a template and just change it to make it work for what you're doing. So for example, this is for contacts. Let's say you wanted to have a to-do list. All right. Um, and again, you can make the interface look a little different if you wanted to. But your to-do list, you could start off and have a list of your to-do items. Well, to-do items instead of contacts, right? Maybe you'd order them in a different order. Maybe instead of ordering them by key, or I'm sorry, by name, you'd order them by the sequence that you put in the to-do list. So the earlier you put it in, the higher it would be on the list, maybe. Or maybe you create a priority, and you sort by the priority. All right. Um, when, the, when, the, when the database, um, or when the app is open, it shows you a list of items. Tap on it once, you can see the detail of the to-do list. From there, you can either edit it or delete it. All right. Also from the list, you could click an add to add a new item. That would be basically this application, but using to-do list and fields associated with to-do list instead of using contact information. So yeah, you could take this and tweak it to work for some other database operation. Yes? A design. In other words, what your application is going to do. Uh, what's it going to keep track of? What's your database table look like? Table or tables look like? That sort of thing. Kind of like what you did for that. Yeah. What, what's your screens are going to look like? And so on. I know there's a lot here. But you can take what you have in this example, get this example running, and then you can tweak it to do um, a different sort of database table and operation. Yes? Do you mean... Or which one? OK. There actually isn't one. Well, right, right. Well, you could say what you're going to store in a row. All right. So in other words, what is our address book? Our address book is a list activity. What does that mean? That means that the activity has built in it a list. So you don't define the list in your XML. What do you define in the XML? You define what one row of that list looks like. And in this case, this one row is contact text view. This would contain the name. That's basically our 
Yeah, that's no, because you, if you define it as a list activity, it's, it has a list. It has a list layout, and you don't have to define one of the other layouts. But you do define the layout for a row, because your row could have more than one column, right? If we had a first name and last name field, we could have first name and last name, and we could have two text views in there. Yes? Which attributes do you want to change? Well, well, uh, again, you, this would allow you to edit the individual list item. If you wanted to change something about the list itself, you would go into, this gives you a pointer to the list view. All right. And if we look up what you can do with the list view, that would show you the properties that you could change on a list view. whole bunch of things that you could put. You could put a footer view, you could put something at the bottom of the list. You could put a header view, something at the top of the list, and so on down the line. You can set a drawable. So you could or you could set a drawable for the divider. So you could have a squiggly line between your items if you wanted and so on. So yeah, what you would do is you would you could programmatically set the properties of that list view if you, if you need to do that or if you wanted to change again the way that an individual item would look like you would change the the xml of the individual item yes You could. You could. Um, let's think about how to do that. I guess it would depend on Trying to think if you wanted to add, like, so, like, next to the contact, put in a picture of the person. Yeah, or a picture of any image that you pull up. Right. What I'm thinking is, like, maybe the bit. Right. The thing in there would be, like, a little brown. Right, right, right. Um, well, let's think. Here's how I would suggest to do that, all right? Because that's actually a different problem, all right? One problem would be how to go in and add it so that um, you chose the picture for each person. So, you know, you wanted, you put me in as a contact, you would click select image, it would go out, show you the image picker dialog, you would pick that, or maybe even pop the camera open, and you'd take a picture and go and, and return that. In which case, you could store the picture, and then you'd have to store like a path to the picture in the database. Now, in your case, if you're storing all the NFL teams, effectively, you would want your database to be pre-populated with those teams. You wouldn't want someone going in and having to put in the Atlanta Falcons. It's still the Atlanta Falcons, right? 
Okay. I, I get in trouble because they were playing the Rams the other week, and it's like they kept saying St. Louis Rams, but I heard Los Angeles Rams every single time. All right. You wouldn't want to have the users populate that. You would want to bring up that. Now, maybe they could go in and add scores for a team or whatever, but the list of teams you would want to have pre-populated. And how would you do that? How would you pre-populate a list of teams? Make an array. And where would you put that code? That's that's always that's always a good that's always a good answer. Well, um, my database connector class. What happens when we first go in to the database and open it for the first time? This onCreate method gets called. And what does that do? That creates a table. Now in the case of contacts, it doesn't know who your friends are. So it can't make contacts for you, right? So it gives you an empty database with no contacts and you have to go and put it in. But if you wanted to pull up all right, a list of the however many, 28, 30, 32, whatever number of teams that are there, those are predefined. All right? You could populate the table already by going in and right after you create the table on the onCreate, have a loop that looped through the array and called what? Called an insert operation for each element. Insert team. And then have new contact put, team name, you know, or city, nickname. Um, what would another thing be? The name of the image. All right? And then you could do like we did with the cards. Right? Um, with the cards, we had the name of the image. And we used that to look through the assets to pull up the image. Well, you could do a similar thing in the football database, having the assets, a list of all the team's helmets or whatever, logos. And then you could use the database to do that. So... Again, you, you know, in, in a case like that, you might not be adding anything to the database. The user might not be adding anything to the database. All the ads might be when you first went through and pre-populated the database. But maybe you could do a view by, maybe you could edit to show the team's record, how many wands or losses, or something like that. And maybe you can't delete because you can't just get rid of the Steelers, even though you might want to, all right? But um, you could go in maybe and edit that. And then maybe you could view the, the team in, uh, by, like, conference or whatever. So there's still things that you could do that wouldn't be a big variation from this, but the end application would end up being a lot different than this. So keep that in mind. And, again, for these more advanced assignments, I'm more than happy to work with you individually to work through what you want to accomplish with them. All right? So, um, you know, don't think I'm just like, yeah, well, here's how you do databases. We'll see you in a week. You know, have something for me. All right? So, um, just like with the blackjack one, um, I'm, I haven't planned out next week yet, but I probably will plan some, like, work time so that we could sit down and work through some of these issues. So, um, at any rate, um, you know, I'd be glad to give you a hand with, with doing that. And in your case, you know, there's X number of teams in the league, whatever. If you didn't want to go and put every team in, because that would be tedious, you could just do like the Browns division or something, and that would be what, like five or six teams or whatever. Other questions? All right. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you next week. Yeah. Pardon me? Okay. It's fun being a designer because then you can dream up all kinds of things. What's tough is actually going in and doing it. Yeah. Oh.
shit. How do you get rid of that? There you go.